Katie Heron's story arc in Mean Girls is really a study of the dangers of peer pressure. When Katie starts going to a normal high school after a life of homeschooling, her journey showcases how seductive peer pressure can feel. At first, Katie doesn't fit any of the clearly delineated categories that her peers are neatly sorted into. You got your freshmen, ROTC guys, preps, JV jocks. And as a result, she feels completely alone, ostracized by the student body. I'm a new student here. My name is Katie here. Talk to me again and I'll kick your ass. So Katie lets herself be directed, first by Janice and then by the plastics. She learns to blend in and eventually achieve social validation by following others' rules and copying their behavior. But this means completely losing sight of herself and denying her true interests. And ultimately, her popularity comes at the expense of her happiness. Here's our take on how Katie Heron illustrates that adolescence is about figuring out who you are, not who other people think you should be. After a childhood of warm, nurturing homeschooling and open-minded travel, Katie is suddenly dropped into a high school experience that's defined by intense pressure. I had never lived in a world where adults didn't trust me, where they were always yelling at me. Within this environment, where there is little trust from the adult authority figures and a plethora of arbitrary rules that dictate daily routine, Don't read ahead. No green pen. No food in class. It makes sense that students look to their peers to establish a sense of order. Initially, peer pressure is what helps Katie get over her culture shock. That peer pressure doesn't come at first from the popular group, the Plastics. It comes from outsiders, the so-called art freaks Janice and Damien. They trick and manipulate her into skipping class to hang out with them by dangling the promise of friendship in front of her. I know it's wrong to skip class, but Janice said we were friends and I was in no position to pass up friends. This feels like a warm and friendly thing to do, but it still pressures Katie to ignore her own instincts. Her new friends then present her with a map of the lunchroom as a guide to who's cool and who's not, and encourage her to be fearful of the situation as they warn her about who she should and shouldn't get caught up with. Where you sit in the cafeteria is crucial. They also tell her not to join the group that she, as someone with a natural gift for math, probably has the most in common with, the mathletes. You can't join mathletes, it's social suicide. And this advice actually echoes the words of Queen Bee Regina George, who earlier gave Katie the same tip. You cannot do that, that is social suicide. Proving that rules like how uncool it is to join the math leads actually come from the top down. When Katie is asked to join the Plastics for lunch, it doesn't feel like she has much of a choice. Much like she, Karen, and Gretchen don't have a choice when it comes to wearing pink on Wednesdays. You can only wear your hair in a ponytail once a week. If you break any of these rules, you can't sit with us at lunch. Well, I mean, not just you, like any of us. These rules don't have any meaning behind them, as Regina later admits. They're purely about enforcing assimilation and imposing the superiority of the person at the very top. Those rules aren't real. They were real that day I wore a vest. Because that vest was disgusting. But because almost everyone follows them, no matter how miserable they might feel, they believe that there's no alternative. At first, Katie's journey of following peer pressure appears necessary to her and not all that draining. But over time, it comes at a cost. And that cost is herself. Love ya, bye. She eventually metamorphoses into a plastic, a cold, artificial person with little relation to her inner self and in clear contrast to the organic world she's come from. As she rises up the social hierarchy, there's an erosion of her personality that she doesn't realize is happening until she's alienated all of the people who truly care about her. All my friends hate me and now my mom hates me. Your mom does not hate you. She's afraid of you. She has to start from scratch again, once more isolated from the student body, eating lunch on her own in the cafeteria toilets. But this time, she gets her happy ending by not giving in to peer pressure, following her heart, and doing what she thinks is the right thing. High school movies are all about social currency. What are the traits that move you up the social ladder, and what are the ones that keep you down? To everyone here who matters, you're vapor. In She's All That, Lainey Boggs is clearly beautiful, a quality prized by her classmates. But because she's interested in art and has unique style, she remains at the bottom of the ladder until she's effectively socialized by Zach. Do you always wear those glasses? Yeah, why? You ever think about contacts? The popular teens in these stories are also keenly aware that social cachet is conditional and can go away if a popular teen breaks the rules. In the faculty, Stan has peak social status as a star football player dating the head cheerleader, but his girlfriend makes it clear that popularity won't endure if he quits the team to focus on his studies. The accepted social order is head cheerleader, state star quarterbacks, not academic wannabes. Katie has an advantage in rising up the ranks due to a social currency she naturally possesses, her beauty. Oh, you'll get socialized all right, a little slice like you. 
It's telling that both Janice and Regina remark on this when they first meet her. You're a regulation hottie. You're like really pretty. What differs is how each group reacts to this social currency. For Janice, it's almost with a tone of resignation. She sees quickly that Katie will have more social currency than she does, which does ultimately become a threat to their budding friendship. Damien, who seems more content with himself and his place in this structure, urges Katie to embrace her hotness. Own it. Meanwhile, Regina's reaction is combative, treating Katie's beauty as a potential threat to her position at the top of the pecking order. So you agree? What? You think you're really pretty? In fact, it's not a desire for friendship, but this beauty and resulting social currency that motivates Regina to bring Katie into her group, so that she can control the outside threat of a hot new girl. Get in, loser! We're going shopping! Katie's growth and popularity is mirrored by her showing off her looks more as the film goes on. This is illustrated in how differently she approaches the two parties she goes to in the film. At the early Halloween party, she goes as a zombie bride-esque ex-wife, making herself as ugly as possible, because her goal isn't to look hot, but to have fun. Hey! Why are you dressed so scary? It's Halloween. But she learns a key lesson when the other girls dress for maximum sexiness. Halloween is the one night a year when a girl can dress like a total slut. And Regina scores a kiss from the hot popular guy Katie is pining over, Aaron Samuels, while dressed in a revealing bunny costume. By the time Katie's a plastic throwing her own party, she's got great hair and makeup and is wearing a far more glamorous, revealing party dress. Still, rather than truly owning her hotness as Damien encouraged her to do, she's just imitating Regina's styles and mannerisms. She's still obviously beautiful, but in a way that's inauthentic and not truly attractive in a deeper sense. I know it may look like I'd become a bitch, but that's only because I was acting like a bitch. And whereas Aaron seemed to like her initially when she was being herself, And you are a zombie bride. An ex-wife. Love it. He's turned off by this more appearance-obsessed Katie because he recognizes she's not being herself. You are just like a clone of Regina. The reality is that Katie can be hot and authentically her. She can be in the mathletes and still get the guy. It's a lie perpetuated by these hyper-intense social structures that any of these things are mutually exclusive. But Katie has to realize on her own that there don't have to be rigid rules about what behaviors you have to engage in to make other people like and accept you. If you dare to break supposed social laws that don't make sense to you, you might find that others are willing to go along too. Why is everybody stressing over this thing? I mean, it's just plastic. Katie is far from the only person in this film who feels unhappy because she diminishes some aspect of herself in order to fit in. Gretchen may be the second most popular girl in school, but she too is a victim of Regina's peer pressure. Regina consistently clamps down on Gretchen's individuality, forcing her to tow Regina's party line. Gretchen. Stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. Even Regina's cruelty comes from a place of fear, insecurity, and being out of touch with how she's really feeling. We get hints that her home life isn't providing the order and normalcy she craves. I'm not like a regular mom. I'm a cool mom. <laughs> right, Regina? Please stop talking. She has few outlets in her life besides fixating on her appearance. My pores are huge. And she makes choices based on protecting her status, rather than doing what she actually wants to. Whether that's befriending her potential rival, Katie. She doesn't even like you that much. Or dating Aaron, even though she doesn't seem into him, because she can't let another girl get the validation of being with one of the school's most popular boys. Ironically, some of the characters in the film who seem the happiest are the least popular ones. Damien is a social outcast like Janice, but he's comfortable in his own skin and his sexuality, and so he can fight through any abuse he receives. Don't you bring it down today? Even more confident still is Kevin, the captain of the mathletes. I'm a mathlete, so nerd isn't bird, but forget what you heard, I'm like James Bond the third. Despite that group being social suicide according to her friends, he has the swagger of a popular high school jock and views himself on an equally elite level. He's in no way awed by Katie's social status or beauty, and even rejects the idea of dating her when he thinks she has a crush, despite the fact that being with a plastic would undoubtedly increase his objective popularity. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I only date women of color. He's excited about the Mathlete State Championships and pleased with the size of the audience. Because even though it might not be the crowd the football games get, he's not torturing himself by making that kind of comparison to other people's lives and priorities. Excellent. Great turnout this year. 
Both Damien and Kevin show that by tuning out peer pressure and tapping into what you think is cool, you'll be much more content in the long run, even if that comes at the expense of some social currency. At the end of the day, all that currency is fleeting, fragile, and relative. Within the circle that he cares about, Kevin has just as much authority as Regina does. And in a few years, being accomplished at math will probably mean more in the adult world than having been spring fling queen. Damien, too, may have fewer friends, but having just one friend who loves you for you is more fun and satisfying than attracting flocks of worshipful underlings who don't really like or get you. I really want to lose three pounds. Oh my god, what are you talking about? You're so skinny. Ugh. Shut up. Katie's act of sharing the spring fling crown is an act of recognizing the person in everyone. Because while the lie of social hierarchy is that we all have to be ranked as better or worse, the truth is everyone has their own particular potential. I think everybody looks like royalty tonight. Katie eventually recognizes that happiness isn't tied to any markers of status she could achieve, whether that's popularity, her friend group, or her dream guy. Ultimately, none of those things are totally within her control. The fake social hierarchy of Regina's world tries to manufacture a feeling of total power through putting others down, but this doesn't work to counter the powerlessness that's inherent to teenhood and life in general. Calling somebody else fat won't make you any skinnier. Calling someone stupid doesn't make you any smarter. Katie realizes that the key to contentment is focusing on what you truly can control. All you can do in life is try to solve the problem in front of you. Her happiness comes from tapping into her authentic self, because that's the only way to be a real person. I had gone from homeschool jungle freak to shiny plastic to most hated person in the world to actual human being. It's telling how much happier everyone is at the end of Mean Girls when the rigid cliques have disbanded. The new social order still has friendship groups and niches, but by breaking the spring fling crown, Katie symbolically destroys the up-down framework of winners and losers. And this frees the students from that pressure to conform to an inauthentic idea of who they should be. The characters invest instead in activities that give them a satisfying outlet or a sense of achievement. And this is what actually makes people thrive. Feeling good about what we do, instead of worrying about what others see when they look at us. School used to be like a shark tank, but now I could just float. Thank you for watching The Take. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know what you're watching.